Last time there was a question about 牙齿的齿跟颚，跟那个颚还有右边是一个第几页的页。That's a very simple one to answer. If I thought a little bit longer, I probably could have thought of it. And in addition to 牙齿的齿，那左边还可以换一个肉这边，是同一个意思。有牙齿或者肉，那个就是 palate， 就是硬腭，就是上腭。可是右边是第几页的页？那个是 jaw 下颚。<laughs> they both are 颚 and they are both in this 区域 ，so it's confusing. But that's very easy to solve. Okay? So 牙齿的齿加个颚，或者肉这边加个颚 ，that's palate。可是颚加个第几页的页 ，that's jaw 下颚的颚。Okay? That should be considered solved then. Next is vowels and consonants, chapter nine. Any questions? Pass them over to Mendy. Sophie got through them very fast. <laughs> okay.、Um, any questions on chapter nine in vowels and consonants? I'm trying to interpret that expression, Vivian. It was sort of like no, no, no questions. Don't bother me. Or yeah, there's a question, but I forgot where it is. Or something. I can't tell which it is. Anybody else? Anybody else have a question? Okay, Amy. It doesn't really have anything to do with my understanding. It's that、um, on page eighty-nine, on the second paragraph, the last sentence.、Mm-hmm. What exactly does that sentence mean? Like those those hands. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that one. Okay. Let me have a look. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you get it? Do you want to explain it? Okay. Go ahead. Whatever you like. 第一个赖是指，第一个赖是指那个。哎，不是。Had Jones where Smith had 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 the approval of the teacher. The way I read it, it's almost understandable. Not quite, almost. Listen to my intonation. See if that helps clarify it a bit. Jones where Smith had 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 had. Had 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 the approval of the teacher. It almost makes sense the way I read it. The intonation should have helped you understand it a bit, but it's still not that clear. Obviously, it's very artificial. They constructed it just to have fun. Do you want me to explain it, or can you get it? Annie, you look like you almost get it. Um, 就是应该说它有两个答案，一个是 had， 或者 had had， 然后我是觉得是 had。It's more or less right. That's more or less right. So, so Smith, he originally wrote had the 那个地方 where he 就是过去完成式。他之前他有个地方，他只写了一个 had. Smith had had had. But Jones in that same place, he had 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 had, and had 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 the approval of the teacher. It doesn't say that had was wrong, but the teacher said that had had was okay. You got it. Very good. I can tell by your faces you got it. Okay. That was just for fun. You can do it, but it's very artificial. I went to a conference in <clears throat> Hong Kong, a phonetics excuse me, a phonetics conference in Hong Kong,、uh, summer before last, and there was a Chinese sentence like that. Not exactly the same thing because it wasn't the same word over and over again, but it was very similar, and it was. It was all about mommy and mommy, and I can't remember the whole sentence right now. I have to look it up online. But if you look up mommy online, mommy and mommy, you will find it. Sort of like,、um, sort of like mommy me mommy, something like that.
It was a question, it was a sentence like that, and they were using that to try and prove something about intonation or phonetics, whatever. And I didn't really understand the sentence without seeing it. When I read it, I understood it right away. Just, just by hearing it, I found it very difficult to understand. But they were basing a whole argument on that sentence, and I don't agree with that. If you're going to do something in phonetics, what kind of data do you think is best? Naturally. Yes, right there. Naturally generated, naturally produced speech. Just catch people saying things that they just say during the day. Now, it's not ethical to sneak up on somebody and record them. That's not allowed. People will do it anyway, but don't do it because if you use it in your research, somebody will definitely criticize you and your research probably will not be accepted. So you have to get permission. If you have permission, it's okay. And you can also create a situation where people will produce pretty naturally sounding speech, which is what I tried to do in my Taiwan English research. I had people sit down and first they read a passage in, in Chinese. So when, when they read the English, it was already familiar. They already knew the meaning from the Chinese. Then I gave them about 30 different topics. I said, just look these over for a while. Pick one that appeals to you. For example, um, when you were scared, a time when you were scared, or when you had an accident, or when you were really happy and excited. Just a bunch of really general topics. I had them pick one, and then I said, now please tell a story about this. You know, something, some time when you were scared, for example. And they would tell the story in Chinese. And once you've told the story in Chinese, you no longer have to think about content. You've already figured the content out. It's easy in your native language. The structure is also already pretty clear as well. So after they finished telling the story in Chinese, I had them tell the same story in English. And usually by then, the English came out pretty smoothly because they'd already thought about it. So they didn't have to spend a lot of time working on both content and structure, and then in addition, try to figure out the English. I'm just giving that as an example. I think it worked pretty well. That's one way to get pretty natural data. You know, you just say, well, here's a topic, think about it, and then talk about it, record. And you have them sign a permission slip, and you're okay. All right, that's what I think is a good way to get data. For different situations, you will need different kinds of data because there's one kind of data that you can only get spontaneously, at least I felt so when I was doing this paper about jiao wang guo zheng. For example, yi er shan shi, wu liu qi ba jiu si. Some people do that, yi er shan shi, but then they'll say si ge ren or something. They do it just opposite. But when they say shan shi, usually they're doing it for a special reason because ta men jue zi chang he bi jiao zheng shi. So they're using more formal sounding speech. And if you put somebody into a laboratory or if you say, well here, record this, they're going to be very self-conscious. So that's not the situation where they will produce hypercorrect forms in Mandarin. They will do it in a situation where they feel they have to appear confident and authoritative. So I had to pick it up on the fly. I didn't record anybody, but I listened, I memorized it, and I wrote it down. That's actually legal. That's okay. So I got my data that way. Otherwise, I wouldn't know what the situation was where people use it and where they don't. A laboratory is not where you get it, so you can't have them come in and do it. So as soon as I heard something, for example, 有个人在做一个捷运的简介, he would often say 是 instead of 是 in that situation. Because he was running the meeting and he was giving a talk, he was considered an authority. So that was one thing almost all my data had in common. The person wanted to sound authoritative and formal. So that was the way I could get that. But you're not allowed to record that. Writing down is okay though, <laughs> all right? Um, okay, so that's that question. Anything else in this chapter? Yeah. Do, do little words and small words mean functional words? Uh, it's on page 92. 92, okay. Yeah. The last paragraph. Second, second. Mm -hmm. In the first sentence, here's the little words like of the of two. Okay, here it says little words. What does it say small words? It's probably the same thing. In this context, because when we're trying to get computers to recognize human speech, it's just like with second language learners. The really hard part is the function words because we de-stress them, they're very fast, they're very short. Those are harder for second language learners to learn. And even native speakers may sometimes miss them. But we 
miss them less. We're more used to them. If we miss them a lot, we couldn't reduce them that much. Native speakers are usually okay with those, though sometimes we may miss them. But second language learners have trouble with them. You know that when you're doing a listening assignment, you can get the hard words best because they're stressed and they're very clear. But it's the function words that you'll have trouble with. Was it to, was it of, was it at? May not be clear. So yes, in this context, I think they just mean function words. Computers really have a hard time with those. Human learners can be trained, and you can also sort of train computers, but it's a numbers game. It's about probabilities. That's what computers do. It looks at previous data, and it picks the one with the highest probability, which may or may not be right. Okay, anything else? Yeah. So, so we have to uh, transcribe the uh, English letter into IPA symbols so that the computer can Recognize. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, basically, yes. Right. Okay, anything else? All clear? Hand in your work, please. And for next week, please do chapter 10. Yeah. Now, Carol is not here today, so we're not going to have any more special tutorials or anything. We're just going to go through the textbook, and she, I guess, is having this recorded. Is that right? This is being, Sophie, this is being recorded for, for Carol. Okay. So we're just going to try to get through as much of Chapter 8 as we can. We will be finished in another couple classes. We'll be finished very soon. And that's the really, really big accomplishment of the semester. I have a number of additional web pages and tutorials online that we're going to do that have to do with Chapter 8. But we may do some of those in Chapter 9. Okay. Let's just keep going. It's Miranda's turn. Everybody find the place on 207, second paragraph, second complete paragraph. If you want a more difficult exercise in inter interpreting sound spectrograms, look sound at... Sound spectrograms? Sound spectrograms. Grams? Look at grams. Mm -hmm. Look at figure 8.14 and see if you can say what it is. All right. So I guess a lot of you... I feel very wampy when I read this. I would think, no, I don't want a more difficult exercise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's the first thing I think. Um, I'm going to, before you continue, open up another recording, a different version of this spectrogram, because I personally, is this the one? No, it's the next one. That's not so clear. We're going to get through this one, and then we'll see the next one. But since I've started, I might as well open that one up and have it ready. Um, So that will be ready when we get to it. This spectrogram is not so much of a problem, especially since it gives you the answer. But the next spectrogram, I find not as clear, so I re-recorded it. Go ahead. It is an ordinary English sentence. Oh, it sounded like honorary. O ordinary. There we go. English sentence spoken by the British English speaker who said the vowels in figure 8.4. OK, how should we stress that? By the what? by the British English speaker hmm. who said the mm -hmm. vowel. Wait, wait, wait. Let's first figure out what the meaning is. Does English go with speaker or does English go with British? With British because we're saying which kind of English. So the relationship between British and English is closer, so we take care of that first. So it should be. British is a noun or an adjective? It's an adjective, so we say British English. British English. English is stressed. And now we have a noun, and we have another noun, so we say put the whole thing together. Once more. There you go. English has the tonic stress. Okay? When you see a bunch of nouns together that all belong to the same compound, or maybe some of them are adjectives. You'll have to figure that out. Remember that rule. You reduce it down. You just find the pair that has the closest relationship. No matter how many it is, find the pair with the closest relationship. Figure those out first. And if there's another pair, figure that out first. And then keep going until you've figured out things for the whole expression. So here we have only three, no problem. The two with the closest relationship are British and English. Adjective noun, British English. 
Then we just treat it like a single noun. 一旦处理过以后，你把它当做一个单独的 noun. If it's if it's too, you know, no matter what it is, you just treat it like a noun. So British English speaker. All right, go on. Mm. That's right. You could say if we were contrasting it, but did we have a strong contrast with American here? No. If we don't, then we're just going to take it as something new. So then comes up a very good question about how long ago counts. If it was really long ago, then it's counted as new. Or if there is not a really clear contrast, like I said, there is nothing really close by that says American English, so we're expecting a contrast. In that case, we just treat it like it's something new. But that was a good question. Okay. The British English speaker who said the vowels in Figure eight point four. You will find it hard to determine the whole sentence. 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 Remember continuation, rise. Okay. But some segments. But are, but what? But some.、Mm? But some segments.、Mm-hmm. Why?、Uh, contrast. Contrast. Are quite easy. For example, what must be, what must be there when the third formant is below two thousand hertz, near fourteen to fifteen. All right.、Um, two things. Uh, what must be there? What must be there? Maybe it 应该是哪个东西在哪里 Maybe it 应该有个什么东西 is what it means. So what must be there? What must be there? Good. And the second thing is, do you go up or down at the end of the sentence? Because it's not a.、Uh, it's a W H question. Right. H H H. Mm-hmm. Good. Uh, what must be there when the third formant is below two thousand hertz near fourteen to fifteen? Good. Can you see a distinctive pattern of the second and third formants at twenty six, and perhaps also at twenty four to twenty five? Very good. Also. Also. Very good. Let's look at this. What can we recognize? So let's just start with what he suggests: fourteen to fifteen. What do we see there? What does it look like? Fourteen to fifteen. Go ahead, Sylvie. Uh huh. Okay, that looks a lot like an R. And what else does he want us to look at at twenty-six? What does twenty-six look like? And maybe twenty-four and twenty-five. If you're not sure, that's okay. You should have done it ahead of time, but that's all right. Let's just keep going, and then we'll figure it out step by step, like we did before. Next paragraph. At the beginning, below one, there is a small fricative noise near three thousand hertz. Then, at two, there is a vowel that might be e or i, a sharp break. break In the pattern is followed at three by the second. Break, sorry, break. Break. Break, not break. Break. Break.、Mm-hmm. A sharp break in the pattern is followed at three by a segment with faint formants at about two hundred fifty. Two fifty, okay. Two fifty, thirteen hundred and twenty-four hundred hertz. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Go ahead. This break must indicate. This break, break is a an important content word. So this break, this break, this break, this break、mm-hmm. must ind- indicate a nasal or a lateral. A nasal. A nasal、mm-hmm. or a nat- lateral. Lateral. Lateral.、Mm-hmm. With a lateral, with a lateral being the more. With a lateral, the first time was fine. With a lateral, lateral. being the more probable here. All right. Two things to point out to all of you,、um, because it's actually the same things that I noticed with Miranda, and that is continuation rise. You need to remember continuation rise. So don't go down when you get to a comma. When you get to a comma, we go right tonic down and up again. Tonic is high down, up again. The little song、hmm, is what we usually do. 
The second point is, what do we do after we finish the subject of a sentence? Right, and it may not be a sentence; it may just be a clause. 可能是一个子句 A 子句 may also have a, a, a sentence. A, sorry, a subject. So, be watching as you're reading along for the end of the subject and take a little pause there. And you need a little song there. You need a little continuation rise. So that's for everybody. And we've heard these things many times, but now we need to be reminded. I think once in a while, so we put them into practice. If we just learn the rules, we're probably not going to change the way we speak. So every time that somebody gets a little correction in class, that's one more little push for you to remember to do it yourself in your speech. Okay?、Um, let's just cover what they covered so far. Here we have a little bit of fricative noise near 3,000 hertz, just a tiny bit of fric fricative noise, which doesn't tell us very much. So there's probably some kind of aspiration there, right? Probably some kind of aspiration. Then at two. We have a vowel that might be e or i. How do we know that? Low and high of two. Okay, and they're really spread far apart. It's really based on the Ming Xian. So these vowels are one of our inner circle of friends because they're so easy to recognize. So some aspiration and something that looks like an e or possibly an i. So just from those two things, what would you get? Take aspiration and add an e or i. What do you get? Probably he, right? So that means we've fixed that probably. A sharp break in the pattern means we probably have what? Some kind of a change. And at three, we've got these three frequencies. Let's just flip back to remind ourselves of the frequencies for nasals and laterals. Two hundred four. What's the difference? Nasals are about two hundred fifty. Twenty-five hundred, thirty-two fifty, and laterals are around two fifty, twelve hundred, twenty-four hundred. That's a nice review. So two fifty, twenty-five hundred, thirty-two fifty is nasals, two fifty, twelve hundred, twenty-four hundred is laterals. So what do we have here? Yeah, thirteen hundred is pretty close to twelve hundred. So we probably have a lateral. Good. Go on. Um, if you look at figure,、uh, look is that a content word? If you look、mm -hmm. at figure eight point three, good, you will see that the vowel at five is something like a or e. All right, let's look at five. Actually, we don't have to go back to eight point three because we've run into this lots of times. When you see what, then you can guess it might be a. An even distribution, right? A pretty even distribution of the formants, so it's probably a, okay, or e, a or e. They're very close, as you so painfully know. All right, go on. This this is followed by a fricative at six, that could only be th or f. Why can it only be th or f? So here we are at six. And it must be either th or f because. What are the other alternatives for fricatives? First of all, is it voiced? No, it's not voiced. So number one, it could be voiced, and we devoiced it. It's possible, but we're guessing because it's so light. It's probably voiceless. And in addition, what do we know that it is not? Assuming we know it's a fricative, we know that it's probably not. S and it's not because. You mean that plus something else? There, are, the frequencies aren't high enough. That's true. Good. What else? It's not noisy enough, and sh are really noisy. These are quieter fricatives, and the quieter fricatives are f and th. So that's why he says if we see this little wispy bit of activity in this area that shows some kind of very quiet noise. We we know it's probably a fricative, but it's a quiet fricative, which means f or th. Okay, go on. At seven, there is a voiceless stop. I say voiceless. Voiceless. Good. Stop, p, t, or k, with the aspiration at eight, being strong and at high frequency, making it most likely t. Okay, so we've got that. Friction. Then we've got a stop. We've got a break, 
And then we've got a spike. The spike tells us that that was probably a voiceless stop. We've got some aspiration after it. And because we've got so much energy there, and it's strong at, it's strong and it also goes up to a pretty high frequency. That's why we think it's probably t, because t is the loudest. What's the second loudest? K and then p, which is kind of funny because we expect p to be loud because it's at the lips and that's closest to the outside, closest to our ears. But this is the way it is. That's the hierarchy. T is the loudest. K is number two. P is number three. Go on. Mm. The vowel at, at nine is again either e or it, judging by the first two formants. Okay, low F one, high F two. The second formant falls slightly. Falls. Falls mm -hmm. slightly in ten. Slightly. Slightly. There we go. First of all, the vowel. Who's a slide? Who's a huaning a slide? Remember Canadian raising. 如果i后面是五声的话, we don't say i, we say i. So slide, s-l-i-d-e, slide, 滑下去, slide. But 一点点, slight. Everyone slide. Slide. Slight. Slide. So it's going to be short, and the vowel is going to be higher, slight. Try it again. Slight. 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 Yeah, smile a little, pull your tongue up, slight. Slight. Slightly mm -hmm. in ten. In ten. In ten. Right. Indicating diphthongization. Mm -hmm. I would say diphthongization. Brits probably would say I. Uh, either one's fine. Uh, so we're at ten, and we can see that what looks like an e or an i is changing. So we've got some kind of a diphthong there, apparently. Are we okay so far? Now. Most of us probably would not have gotten all this information just looking at it cold without the book helping us. But with the book helping us, holding our hand, we're getting in the habit of recognizing a number of things, associating certain patterns with certain sounds, like even distribution, probably a eh or a. Eh. And this really wispy fricative, probably f or th. And remember that diphthongs will see movement in the formants if it's a diphthong and we have a vowel. Uh, aspiration we've noticed and stops a lot of aspiration after the stops we're going to see that spike so then it's either PT or K and then we can judge if it's one or the other based on the amount of energy and how high the frequencies are okay 208 yeah um you're asking about the about the what where the vowel is darkest then there's, there's a there's a lateral before that oh. where it's lighter that's the lateral and suddenly it breaks and gets clearer that's the vowel Okay? Yeah. Okay, so for number eight, going into nine, you can see that it's lighter. So that's where the lateral is. When it gets darker and clearer, then we've got the vowel. Okay, continue. As there seems to be a pause after 10, we can stop there for a moment and write out our possible transcription choices. One. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, question. So we've already figured that one out, huh, because it's just aspiration. Two, e, e or e. e, or e. Mm -hmm. Three, e, uh, mm, or mm, mm. Right, or some kind of nasal, but we already decided it's probably a lateral, because based on the frequencies we saw. So, e, u is all pretty good. And then four, nothing, five. Mm -hmm. Five, a, uh, e. Uh. And we're not sure uh. about that one. It could be a, it could be e. Six. This one we're not sure of either because both of them are very quiet. Th is quieter than th, but we have nothing to compare it to, so we can't be sure. Seven, t, k, p. Probably t for the reasons we gave. Eight, um, aspiration. Mm -hmm. Nine, e, i. Backwards, but yes. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Ten, nothing here blank. yet. Good. Continue. Can you make a pattern? Can you? Oh. 
Oh, watch the end. Can you make a path through these possible choices? The second syllable could be laugh, or laughed, or left. Making a possible phrase, he laughed, or he left. And in Taiwan English, there's not much difference, right? In Taiwan English, they probably sound the same. What was actually said was he left here, but it would be very difficult to get this. You should, however, get segments such as those listed, listed above. Okay, so he's given you the answer of the first part. He left here. We didn't put in number 10. He left here. All right, so now you know that the first part is he left here. Turn back to the spectrogram and match up the sounds as you know them from this phrase with what you see in the spectrogram. He left here. Just do it in your head now. Match the sounds to the markings in the spectrogram. Go ahead. I'll give you just a couple minutes. A minute. Oh, sorry. This wasn't the, this wasn't the L. This is something else. Yeah, that was my fault. It was the aspiration after the T. Huh. Yeah, the L was here. Sorry. Uh -huh. That's the L. He left. So uh, the four is also the L? Yes. Yeah, that's the left. Left. Two. Left. This is the F. This is the T. And then we explode it here. And there's the vowel and there's the R. Okay. Okay. Everybody okay on that? Here, yeah, there's no R. Here, here. That's which is why he didn't put the R there. Yes, thank you. I was inserting it out of habit, but you're right. You're absolutely right. Okay, he left here. Thank you. Let's go on. Now, look at the last part of the sentence in figure 8.14, which is a bit easier. Uh, easier. There is a fricative at 13 to 14, that is s or f. Followed by, uh, followed by a low third formant at 15, indicating er, and then a vowel at 16 to 17, in which the first formant is lower and the second formant higher than, higher. Uh, higher than anywhere else in the sentence, making it cl clearly e. Mm -hmm. Making. Making. Right, and link, making it. Making it. Very good. Okay, so I'll read and then you look at the spectrogram. I'm going to read it again. You look at the spectrogram in 814. Um, there's a fricative at 13 to 14, which is either th or f. So look at 13 to 14, which should be either th or f. Right? And then we have... Alert, uh, it's followed by a low third formant at 15, indicating er. So look at 15. There we have a low F3, which matches up with er. And then a vowel at 16 to 17, in which the first formant is lower and the second formant higher than anywhere else in the sentence, which means that must definitely be an E. So 16 to 17, we see a high F2 in the vowel, low F1 very high, higher than the vowel in he at number two, right? So compare 17 with number two. Well, actually, it goes fairly high, but that one is definitely high. So we've got an E there. Uh, so R and then to an E. Okay, so why don't you just read that again, and then we'll continue. Read the same thing again. Start from the beginning. Just read it again so we have it really clear in our heads. Now, look at the last part of the sentence in figure 8. Sentence. Uh, sentence. Yes, not sentence. It's sentence. Sentence, yeah. sentence uh -huh. in figure 8.14, which is a bit easier. There's a fricative at 13 to 15. That uh, is 14. Uh, of, uh, 13 to 14. Mm -hmm. That is s or f. Right. Followed by a low third formant. At low third formant? Low third formant at 15, indicating er, mm -hmm. and then a vowel at 16 to 17, in at which... At 16 to 17? At 16 to 17, mm -hmm. in which the first formant is lower and the second formant higher, higher than right. anywhere else in the sentence. Anywhere else in the sentence. Anywhere else in the sentence. Else mm. anywhere, anywhere else, else in the sentence. Anywhere else in the sentence. Anywhere else in the sentence, mm -hmm. 
making it and making it clearly e. All right. Go ahead. This gives us the syllable free or three. All right. So let's look at it again. This is either free or three that we have in front of us between 13 and 17. So from 13 to 17, it could be three or free. Three or free. Let's go on. You can see a little bit of voicing. Uh, you can see a little bit of voicing near the base bass line as 17 to 18 during what uh, what is presumably a voiced stop. All right, let's look at 17 to 18. Can you see that little bit of voicing that starts and then it doesn't really go through? 17 to 18. 比较下面的部分有一点点灰灰的 voicing and then it stops. Right? So we've got a stop there, but it's probably voiced because that voicing suggests it's probably voiced. Okay, or that, that marking rather. Go ahead. The intensity of the burst, the high frequency energy, and energy, the energy, and the level, and the level formants. Level formants. If we're not cutting off, if we're not putting a sort of break in there, if things belong together, then don't go down. So here it's 平的共振风,是平的. So we don't want to break off after level. And the level formants, level formants, that's stress plus a tonic. Level formants. And the level formants mm -hmm. at, the, at the onset of the vowel, the all, vowel. The vowel mm -hmm. all suggest that there's d. Suggest uh, this that. Is d. Uh -huh. All right, so here we're at 17 to 18 again. We've got that some kind of a stop. It's probably voiced, which means it's either B, D, or G. But he's suggesting it's probably D. What's the reason? Look at it again. Look at the spectrogram. We're now around 17, 18, 19. That's where we have the little burst there, but it doesn't look like a voiceless burst. And then what is it that suggests that it might be D. What suggests it might be D? Yeah, is, what does it say about that? What, what about the beginning of the vowel formants? What happens to formants after a stop when they're going into a vowel? If it's a bilabial, the formants will be? will be pushed down, right? And if it's alveolar, the formants will tend to be level, right? And if it is alveolar, then two and three will come together, right? So those are our main cues for trying to guess which stop it is of the three. So he's saying it might be a D. We could be wrong, though. OK, keep going. The vowel at 20 to 21 is long and almost as high, first formant low and front, second formant high as the preceding vowel, making it probably A. Mm -hmm. Making, watch your making it. Mm. Making it. Right, okay. So here, 20 to 21, we have a long vowel and it's almost as high and front as the preceding vowel, which means it's probably A. So look at numbers 20, 21. And we've got, again, low F1, high F2, but not quite as high as, as what? The pre preceding two. 之前有两个E,对不对?那这个的F2没有那个E那么高,比较一下,有没有?F2是不是比那些稍微低一点?对不对? Compare the two E's that we have. Where are the E's located? What numbers? Two and three, yeah, and? 16, 17, all right, and you can see that F2 is lower, right? Yama? Sawe di dian. Okay, he thinks that, go on, it's probably going to be A, A. So if we're right about the D and we put A with it, then we've got a word there, right? And continue. Uh, number 23 is clearly a fricative looking like s looking looking ah, like watch the ink. looking looking like s but because of its lack of intensity it may be z with voicing 
uh, with voicing too faint to be seen. All right, 23. Now there we've got what could be, s we don't see much voicing, but a voiceless s is very noisy. A voiceless s is very noisy. Does this one look as noisy as some of the other s's we've seen before? Let's just compare it to a previous one where we learned about s's. Um, for example, um, on page 205, started in number 12, between 11 and 13 on page 205, that's a s started again. So compare that to what we see here. Which one is darker? The previous one or this one? It's much darker, isn't it? Because a voiceless fricative will be much noisier. S is noisier than z. Now, using our ears, we think z actually should be louder because of the voicing. But what happens with voicing that makes something less noisy? That makes a fricative less noisy. Here it's definitely noisier because we don't have voicing with s. But on the spectrogram, if we have a voiced fricative, it will tend to have less energy where we expect to see the noise, right? It has less energy. Why would a voiced fricative have less energy than a voiceless one in the noise area? If you try to ignore my voice, just kind of get a feel for the energy that's being produced through friction up here. So just listen to me and then Can you kind of hear that s going down a little bit? What causes that? Why? When you're voicing, you have the right idea. There's still air coming out, but what's happening to it? Not so much. Not so much. That's right. It's being chopped up. Because your vocal folds are opening and closing, it's actually impeding the flow of air. The energy is going to be lower because you don't have so much air pushing out, making all that noise. So that's why voiced fricatives will have less energy in the noise area. They could have more energy if you actually voice them. But this one had the noise reduced, but the voicing didn't really come through. So it's basically sort of following what a Z is supposed to do by having less energy in the noise, but it got devoiced. Mere some voicing. So it probably should have been a Z, but didn't get much voice. Not much voicing, okay? It was too faint to be seen. There may have been voicing, because it singing xiao dao, nigga spectrogram. Okay. There is a very short vowel at 24, and a good rule for such vowels is to regard them as a. Uh. Good. All right. Watch for short. Look at my mouth. Not short. Short. Open your mouth more. Short. The problem is too much rounding for sh in Taiwan, right? Like shu. But we don't want shu, you want shi. Short. Yeah. Less, less rounding for sh and it'll sound more natural. And so let's find the vowel that he's talking about. It's at 24. 24, the vowel is quite short. Compare it to some of the other vowels, especially the diphthongs. It's very clear, though. The marks are very dark, so we know it's a, it's a, it's a completely voiced vowel there. But it's just very short. And the distribution is, it's a little bit like an e or an i, right? And British schwas tend to i. American, American schwas will tend more to uh. So it might be because of his British accent. So for example, bushes, he might say bushes. His schwas will tend a little more towards i. So the vowel there looks sort of like an i, but it's a bit lower. So when we see a vowel quite that, sh just you know, this short, we can guess it probably is a schwa. Okay. 
The velar pinch indicated. Slow down. The velar pinch. The velar pinch. Velar 不用太低 The velar pinch. They're both stressed, but pinch gets tonic. The velar pinch indicated that the consonant at twenty-five、uh, to twenty-six must be a velar stop. Hmm. Velar stop. There we go. <laughs> okay, you have to watch that. For a while, it's going to be mechanical. You have to quickly analyze: is it an adjective? Is it a noun? Is it an exception? But 时间久了会变习惯 and then you don't have to think. It will just happen. That's automating. So at fifth,、uh, twenty-five to twenty-six, look at the end of that very short vowel. Do two and three come together? Yes, they do. Okay, and we can always be happy when that happens because then we've gotten another piece of work off our hands. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a velar pinch there. So a schwa plus a some kind of a velar there. And continue. The final、uh, the final long vowel is twenty-seven to twenty. Long schwa, do you be ma? The final long vowel、mm-hmm. at twenty-seven to twenty-nine is a diphthong. Diphthong. End, diphthong.、Mm-hmm. Ending in a a back vowel.、Mm? Back back vowel.、Mm. Back vowel. Right. You'll do be ma. We have long vowel, but does long contrast with with back? These two are not related. So that's why back vowel still needs to be pronounced as a phrase and not a compound, or we don't use、um, con- contrastive stress. So ending in a back vowel. Go ahead. Ending in a back vowel, low second formant, like o.、Oh. Okay. So twenty-seven to twenty-nine. That's a pretty long vowel, and that means that we've got a diphthong, and we can see a lot of movement in the formants, especially which formant. Yeah, F two. There's a lot of movement going down. So we started up from something like an i or a schwa, and it's going down to something that's typical of u. So if we put in British English a schwa plus an u, what do we get? O. We get o. All right. So we're going to finish this up. Next reader. Putting this last part together, we have. Thirteen、uh, to fourteen, or fifteen, 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 or fifte
It's, it's possible it may have influenced it, but that's not what I have in mind. Everything will influence everything on some level. Sylvia's definitely on the right track. She's just missing one more little bit that I think we should add on that will make it, I think, more convincing. Yeah, the fricative is followed by a voiceless stop. That's sort of what Wendy was saying. It's a fricative followed by a stop that's going to make it short. And it's voiceless besides, so that'll just kind of keep it pretty quiet. But one more thing. At the beginning, and, and Sylvie said it was, it was uh, an initial, an onset. But one more thing. It's not just any old onset. No, that's not kind of that's not where I'm going with this. Look at what's what's happening between eleven and thirteen. What's happening there? Nothing at all. Because there's a pause. Because look at the sentence. How did he how did they write it? Typographically, how did they mark that? With a dash. And a dash, it's a real break in the discourse. So, he left here three days ago. It's not, he left here three days ago. It's, he left here, 然后呢多久? Three days ago. There's quite a long pause there. So, it's almost as if three days ago is a new sentence. It's almost like a new sentence. And we're going to have a lot of energy at the beginning. Something new. So, three. The R may have something to do with it. But after that pause, we're starting something new. And then you said that it's before a stop. That probably also has to do with it, too. But it's right at the beginning. And we're going to make it pretty clear. Okay? Anything else? Yeah. Ah, what is missing? Actually, we did mention. It's a schwa. Yeah, a go. So put a schwa in there to fill in the blank. At number 27, where it says 27 to 29. The last diphthong, a go. A go. Put a schwa before the u. Okay? Everybody got it? At the beginning, it's uh. Six, so here. Uh, 26, to 27. 26, about 26 to 27, yeah. And then the rest is the uh. But it's not as though it's two distinct mm -hmm. vowels. They're moving into each other. Or the first one's moving into the second one, you should say. Okay? So a go. O is slowly sliding into the u. And it's a pretty smooth trans transition. So about, um, about 27 is the uh. And then we're moving into the uh, the uh, sorry. Okay? So we're going to do another sentence, but this one does not have the answer given in the book. We're going to do that second, uh, second hour. But it's good to, first of all, review this again before we come back for second hour and start to have a look at 8.15 because that's what we're going to be working on. If you become familiar with it beforehand, it'll be a lot smoother, a lot easier. Okay? And just before break, I'll do a quick book share so we can get started on what we're doing right away, second hour. This is yet another book that I got with my last order to Amazon. And the reason I got this is because every once in a while, I consider changing the textbook to something else. I thought of it maybe two or three times over the years. And then I look at, I go through the same process but not quite as bad as I did the first year, before the first year I taught this course, what textbook am I going to use? I posted a question to the linguist list and I went to Cranes and to Bookman, to all the stores, I checked online, and I decided on Latifoget. That was in, what, 1999 or something like that? Long time ago. And then another year I thought, well, I've been using Latifoget every year. We do get new editions, but it's Latifoget, Latifoget, and Latifoget, so I thought, Maybe I'll have a look at the other books. And I won't list the ones that I considered. I went to Cranes. What happened? I ended up with Latifoget again. <laughs> so 
This time when I put in my order to Amazon, I hadn't ordered books for a long time, so I got a lot at once. I had seen this one, I think it was announced over the linguist list. And I looked online and it looked pretty interesting and I thought this is a book I should at least know about. So I ordered it, it's called The Sounds of Language, An Introduction to Phonetics and Phonology by Elizabeth C. Tsiga. And first of all, you can see it is thicker and heavier, right? And so you can guess it's also more expensive. Although Latifolk, it is very expensive in the US, I've told you. It's like 60, 70 US dollars. This one was, I think, around 50 US dollars. 大概, as I remember. Probably around $50 US. So first of all, if I change the book to this, it would be expensive for you guys, which nobody likes. Students really complain about expensive textbooks. What about the uh, international edition? edition? This one just came out, and I'm guessing they don't have an international edition. They have international editions most often for popular textbooks. If they think it's going to sell well abroad, So this one just came out. It's very new. And I just wanted to have a look. And it's kind of an interesting cover. But one reason it's heavy is because of the paper they use. I think it's coated paper. Now, do you guys want more heavy books to carry around in your backpacks? Do you still use the Norton Anthology or anything like that? Or are you done with that? You're done with that. OK, but some of you I know would maybe just photocopy some of the pages because it was so big and heavy to carry around. I mean, if any of you have back problems or anything, you know, you may be able to blame it on the Lorton Anthology. Um, so anyway, I thought I would have a look. And I had a look at it. It is very interesting. It's something new. They have a lot of different stuff. They have a lot of MRI figures here. You can see their zuti yansa is orange. How do you guys feel about orange for the highlighting and boxes and things? Just, you, you like the orange? Yumi does not like the orange. How about the rest of you? <laughs> Sylvie does not like the orange. How about anybody else? Right. Annie doesn't. Yeah. Tina thinks it's okay. Yeah. Okay, Amy? <laughs> so so? Mary <laughs> Jen. Bella? You think it's okay? I think it's okay. Vivian thinks it's okay. Miranda? You don't like orange, Wendy? Uh, that I have to change my mind. Like, uh, Use a different uh, highlighting pen. Yeah, different highlighter. Because gray, it's okay. Uh-huh, okay. So personally, I don't like the orange. <laughs> <laughs> I don't despise it. I don't despise it. The thing is, somehow, my eyes are telling me it's not very comfortable to look at orange. That's what my eyes are telling me. We know that red is so It also That's why you know, a lot of restaurants, famous fast food places are red. But orange does a little bit of the same thing to me. And because it's lighter, So it's a mixture of and fan. That makes me uncomfortable. I, I was trying to figure out what it was when I was looking at it. So it's not horrible. I can accept it, but I don't care for it. I would prefer any cool color, any cooler color. Green is OK. Blue is OK. Violet is OK. All three of those would be fine with me. But I'm not fond of the orange. <laughs> but that isn't my main reason. I wouldn't use it for this class. I decided fairly quickly. Because you can see in the title, it's phonetics and phonology. This is not a phonology class. We're already very, very busy working on phonetics. Now, of course, if you're interested in phonology, I encourage you to do that. But we don't have time for a lot of work on phonology. In addition, to tell you the truth, even though I was just a chair at a session at a phonology conference where everybody was talking about OT, OK? So that's optimality theory. This is a phonology OT is optimality theory. This is really big on OT. And they talk about generative grammar. It's grammar of phonology. So basically, it looks like it's perfectly good. There's a lot of great information at the beginning. I mean, I wouldn't mind if I had to use it maybe the first half for phonetics. 
but too much phonology, too much of the kind of phonology I don't really do. Heavy, probably expensive, but manageable, and orange. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very sorry. I mean, I don't mean to put it down. There are some people, it, if you like phonology, if you like OT, this is probably an excellent book. And the first half for phonetics is probably very good. A lot of, there's a lot of technical information here that we don't have time for, a lot of anatomy, physiology, etc. Okay, so just sharing that with you. Take a break. One last time before we continue on to a new spectrogram, I want you just to review the sentence, which was what? He left here three days ago. He left here three days ago. Look again at 8.14. Don't look at this yet. Sorry, this isn't even the page we want. We've got a new one. It's here. But don't worry about this. This is not the one. This is the next one we're doing. So please just look at 8.14 again. He left here three years ago. He left here three years ago. Oh, he left here three years ago. Oh, not three years, three days ago. Sorry, my fault. Three days ago. He left here three days ago. I looked at the spectrogram and I saw oh, that's a stop. That's not a year. Okay? So, we've now finished reading how many spectrograms? Okay, which one did we have before then? She came back and started again. Then we had, I should have thought spectrograms were unreadable. And then he left here three days ago. And now we've got one for which we don't have the answer. And this is my rereading of the same thing. So look in your book and compare it to what you see here. It should be fairly similar. The part I thought was harder to read was between 1,000 and about 1,700. That part looked kind of hard to read. I don't know if mine is easier, but we've got this for a second reference. We're going to start now on 8.15. So next reader, please. Try another of these sentences on your own. Figure 8.15 is a spectrogram of the British, British English speaker. Speaker, the utterance is normal English sentence containing, containing Contain, no problem. Contain, 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 more A. Contain, yep. mm -hmm. no proper nouns. Mm -hmm. No proper nouns. No proper nouns. Mm -hmm. As before, Many of the sounds occur in new company. I'll pause a little bit, end of the subject. Mm. Many of the sounds occur in new combinations. In new combinations. In new combinations. Okay, let me just review again for um, a continuation rise. We don't say in new combinations. What would that suggest? In new combinations. It's just a question in that case. Continuation rise is different from a question rise, a yes, no question rise. Are you going now? Going now? But here we say in new, that's stress. New is stress, combin or not stress. Ne is our tonic, it goes high. So with a question, combinations, the tonic will be low and rising. That's our turning point. This should go in your notes, this is kind of important. So if we're using the word combinations as a yes, no question, it would be combinations. And even without a low rising tonic, combinations, it still sounds like a yes, no question. But for continuation rise, we go high up for the tonic. Then for the remaining sounds, we go low and add a gentle rise. That's how a continuation rise works. Combi, we're somewhere in the middle here unstressed syllables in the middle, combinations, combinations. So in both cases, you need to find the tonic. For a yes, no question, it goes low and it rises. For continuation rise, it goes high and drops down quickly and then rises a little bit. 
So both of them rise, but they're different kinds of rises. And for the continuation rise, it's closer to a sentence final drop. It's basically just a sentence final drop, but you come up again a little bit. Okay? So occur. Occur occurring new combinations. Right. Which means that they have slightly different patterns. Mm -hmm. But if you start with the more obvious sounds. Slow down. You're just reading too fast. So slow down. But if you start with the more obvious sounds, obvious is new here. Sounds is repeated, basically, because we've been talking a lot about sounds, right? Many of the sounds occur in new combinations. So, listen. But if you start with the more obvious sounds, but if you start, pause, with the more obvious sounds. But if you start with the more obvious sounds. More, we don't have a Because obvious has contrastive stress. So, more obvious sounds. More obvious sounds. Mm -hmm. Yep. And use your knowledge of possible English words. Words. You go up, remember? The tonic is high, and then we go down. So it's what you did last time. You just made it a simple rise, and then it becomes a question, but it's not a question. Your, uh, use your knowledge of possible English. Everybody? Words. Hmm. Remember the little song? We're going to sing the little song. Some of you who are in my inking class, Three and a half years ago, almost four years ago, right? Former Ingting students and former Dai Yingwen students. Most of you are, in fact. Who of you was not my Dai Yingwen student? Yumi? Vivian? But you were in lab. Right, so you were in lab. Who was not, neither my Dai Yingwen nor my lab student? Amy? And? Okay, and Sylvie. But you were in a previous class with me, right? You sang with me, right? If you Amy, Yumi. Right? Those are the only ones who did not have a class with me long ago. Amy, you never had a class. Yeah. Okay, so phonetics one was your first time and Yumi was the first time. All the rest of you are former students. That's my point. So you've heard this stuff, this this spiel over and over again, right? So sing the little song. I didn't call it continuation rise then. I just called it sing the little song. Right. And it is a little song. Hmm. So if you're not asking a question, if you're coming to a comma, a short pause, just coming to a place where we duan ju, a place where we duan ju, then go up. Just like you do at the end of a sentence or the end of a phrase. Go high for the tonic, come down, and then rise a little bit to let your listener know I'm not finished, there's more coming. So, new combinations, possible English words. There's nothing after words. For combinations, we bin combina A has the stress, right? But we still have another syllable after it. So we can use the other syllable, nations, for the drop and rise. But words is only one syllable. It is the tonic. So we have to spread that whole song over one syllable. Possible English words. Possible English words. Okay? That's how a continuation rise works. We start with the tonic. Tonic is the final stress syllable in a phrase or in an utterance. So go up for the tonic, come down, tiny rise. Um, possible English words. Can you just try the whole sentence again? But if you. But if you, but if you start with a more obvious sounds. And, and use your knowledge of possible English words, Good. you should be able to succeed. Beautiful. Many readers of earlier editions of, of this book. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for that. This is a Shu Tzu. Of this book. Right. Have already done so. Beautiful. Okay, now you've got it. So put that in your notes, remember, for the future. And he wrote this sentence in the earliest edition that I used. So from the first year, that I taught with his textbook, he already said this sentence. Many readers of earlier editions of this book have already done so. So, and he's trying to tell you that other people could do it, you can do it too. That's all he's trying to tell you. Go on. The spectrograms that have been used, Happy to, Amazon. That have been uh -huh. used to illustrate this chapter so far. This chapter, Wendy, look, chapter, not chapter, chapter. chapter. Mm -hmm. 
To illustrate this chapter so far are called wide band spectrograms. They are very accurate in the accurate. time. Accurate. Accurate. Uh -huh. They are very accurate in the in the time dimensions. Time dimension. Time dimension. Okay, dimension is not wrong. I say di. It's more common in British to say die. Time dimension. Time dimension. Mm -hmm. They show each each. Uh, each vibration of the vocal votes as a separate ver vertical line. Vertical line. Vertical line. Mm -hmm. And indicate the... Indicate? Pause. <coughs> a little bit slower. And indicate the precise... Mm -hmm. And indicate the precise moment. Not indicate the... And indicate the precise moment. And indicate the precise moments of a stop burst. Of a... Of a stop burst. Mm -hmm with a vertical spike. Let's make sure we've absorbed everything so far because I've been picking on pronunciation. So far we've been looking at spectrograms that are all wide band. So we talk about broadband quan pin for the Wang Lu, but it's the same idea. We just use a different word for it. Wide band spectrograms. The thing that you need to know for the test that will be coming up is that wideband spectrograms are accurate in the time dimension. You need to remember that. So if we're looking at the vertical pulses, from That means that we are getting a high resolution in time. 就是每一瞬间的变化,它都记录得蛮真实. Are we okay with that? So, when we're moving ahead, we're moving in time. That's the time dimension. All the vertical lines, which represent the pulses of the vocal folds and her voice sound, all of those are going to be nice and clear, so we can count them as we did before. That's the time dimension. However, going up vertically, in the frequency dimension, it's very smudgy. Smudgy. 是模糊的, smudgy, S M U D G E, smudge, 然后 E 换成Y变形容词, it's very smudgy, 好像是那个把它那个磨模糊了,就是手指头在那边磨了半天,把它弄得很模糊, it's smudgy in the frequency dimension, and that's why we have those thick bands and we can't see the overtones separately, or the, we can't see the separate overtones, okay, so you will need that for the test, I can tell you that almost for a certain, go on, but they are less accurate in not the less less yep less accurate in the frequency dimension there are usually several components frequencies frequency component what's more component mm -hmm. component frequencies present in a mm -hmm. presence mm -hmm. in a single format in the in a single format format, format. Mm -hmm. all of them all of them lumped together in one wide band on a spectrogram. Very good. All right. Several, we usually say it with how many syllables? Several. How many? Just two, not several. Several is not wrong, but it's, it sounds too careful. Several. Several component frequencies present in a single format, all of them lumped together in one wide band in the spectrogram or on the spectrogram. So when we're looking at F1, F2, F3, 是很厚,很黑的一条线,很宽的. That's because the frequencies are being smudged together. 通通都被磨成一片了。磨糊成一片了. Um, if we used a narrow band spectrogram, we could see the separate overtones. And we will see them on the next page. Okay, are we okay so far? Just remember that, okay? Wide band, clear in the time dimension. Narrow band is clearer in the frequency dimension. Okay, that will certainly be on a test. Go ahead. It is a fact. It is a fact of physics that one can know either fairly precisely when a song occurs. All right, here when is important. When, when and what you do be. So you're going to have to stress those. When the song occurred, or to a comparable degree of accuracy, what its frequency is. All right. Here it is with the contrastive stress. Everybody pay attention and mark it in a way that you can understand. 
It is a fact of physics that one can know either fairly precisely when a sound occurred, when a sound occurred, or to a comparable degree of accuracy, what its frequency is. So when and frequency actually have the contrastive relationship. It is a fact of physics that one can know either fairly precisely when a sound occurred or to a comparable degree of accuracy what its frequency is. Okay? Let's go on. This should be intuitively clear when you recall that when you recall when you recall that knowing the frequency of a of a sound involves observing the variations in air pressure in 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 air air pressure 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 right no voicing over a period of time okay let's make sure we understand everything as we go along this is what i just explained if you have a wide band spectrogram we can know in considerable detail what's going on time wise if we look at the frequency dimension, it will not be so clear, it will be smudged together. It's a fact of physics. It's not a problem of our technology. It's a fact of physics. Because if we make the spectrogram more sensitive to frequency, that means if we get a certain frequency, we get it exactly right. What happens when we strike something with a very pure frequency? The frequency. Hitting the table, it decays very fast. But if we go, if we tap a glass, it goes ping. It takes a long time to decay, right? Because that's it's one frequency that it really loves. And you set off that frequency in motion. And we don't have other things that are competing with it. It's not like this desk. It, it's got many frequencies that are being set off when I hit the table. But if we hit the glass, the whole glass is made to produce one frequency really clearly. If we get one frequency really clearly, it's going to keep humming and humming and humming. Just like with inta, if you strike an inta, it goes ding. It, go, it gets softer and softer, but it lasts a very long time. So if we are very, very precise about frequency, that means we have a very long decay time. It's going to keep ringing for a long time. And the same is true in a spectrogram. If we make the spectrogram really, really um, sensitive to frequency, it'll keep ringing like crazy when it gets the right frequency. And if it's ringing like crazy, what's going to happen when I make another sound right after this sound? So I just made this sound, right? And the spectrogram found that frequency, and it loves that frequency. It's going to make it really clear, and it's going to keep on ringing. It's going to make the spectrogram keep ringing. But after this sound, I made another one. This one is still ringing, but the spectrogram is expected to pick up this one next. Is it ready? Is the spectrogram ready to pick up a new sound? No, because it's still, it's still ringing away with this sound. Tina isn't getting it. OK. So this has to do with the sensitivity of a spectrogram. If we make it very sensitive to a different tool, to each frequency, spectrogram ring. So for example, in my voice, I've got this pitch, and that just stimulated this part of the spectrogram. So when it got, it's going to show it on the spectrogram, and it's going to keep on ringing and ringing and ringing. Spectrogram frequency. Now you half get it, you get it halfway, right? Does somebody get it all the way? This is actually difficult. I explained this to a person who's really good at phonetics, but not a teacher. 
It took this person a long time to get it. I've already told you about two or three times. When we come back to it again, I'll explain it again, and each time I'll get a little clearer. The point is, if I want the spectrogram to be ready to accept any new frequency that comes in, Frequency,我把它显示出来了。我必须要马上归零,我才能接受下一个frequency。我不归零的话,这个frequency还会继续显示。这个frequency显示完了,你必须要马上归零了,你才可以正确的抓到下一个frequency。要不然这个frequency会
So a very, very smart person with a lot of background, 年纪又比你大许多，他花了很多时间来了解。So if you're sort of getting it now, you're doing very well. That's the main difference between broadband and, and narrowband, or we say wideband. With a wideband, 我们让它瞬间瞬间可以归零，瞬间可以归零，它可以接受下一个 signal。所以变成每一个每一个都很分明。它这个已经放弃了，已经放掉了。它抓到了，放掉了，抓到了，放掉了。那 narrowband， 它抓到了，它就一直。一直一直紧抓着不放 ，OK? So that's why narrowband, 它的那个 overtone, 它会很连续，很很清楚。可是 time 的这个 dimension， 它就不清楚，很模糊了。Just keep in mind, we cannot have both. 呃、uh, ，所以那个鱼与熊掌不可兼得。We have to pick one or the other, OK? Or in English, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You have to pick one or the other. Yeah. The answer is no, because this is just a matter of physics. Busiga technology the wenti. It's that physics does that because as long as it's ringing, ta fang bu diao. Ni ni fang de zai da, ta xia ge shun jian ta hai shi mei gui ling. Ta jiu shi bu hui gui ling, yin wei ta jin zhua zhe bu fang. But that's a good question. My friend asked that question too. 而且他很厉害，他 Cambridge 的 ，OK。他也问了这个问题。He says. You would think that by now, with our technology, we could solve that problem. But it's not a problem of technology; it is a fact of physics. You can't change physics. Okay? I sometimes play with the idea still, because I was always the one in class, like Wendy, who would say, "But, <laughs> but couldn't we?" I was always the one in class. But I was thinking if we could find a way of synthesizing a wide band with a narrow band spectrogram and putting them together. But the the results would be very confusing. You're mixing two kinds of results, so you don't have to accept what I say at face value. But keep it in mind, and as we go along, 你会找到一些东西可以印证 All right, let's keep going. This period of time has to be long enough to ensure observations of a number of repetitions of the variation in air pressure. Hmm. Air pressure. Hmm. Air pressure. There we go. Everybody, air pressure. Air pressure. It's not pressure. Pleasure, 就是娱乐 pleasure. But 压力 is pressure. Two S's, pressure. Okay. Air pressure. Go ahead. You can, you can either know that a pause from the vocal folds has happened. Has happened. Has happened. 这很重。嗯哼。Producing the vert vertical voicing striations in O. 嗯，没有 S。Striation in all the spectrograms we have considered so far. Considered. Considered. Uh huh. Or if the piece piece of the piece. Piece. Please, that's another word. Add it to your list of beach and sheet. Piece. That's another one that goes to your list that you have to be careful of because it becomes it comes out as what? Piece. Yeah, that's 小便 That's why you need to be careful. Because as soon as you say it with the wrong vowel, we can't help it. We we we've already started thinking. You're going to distract your listener, even if he is just a little boy. Ah, he's very little, very little, very little. He won't say "little boy." We can't help it. It's in our brain. So go ahead. If the piece of the of the sound wave has happened, has happened, if the piece of the of the sound wave being of the sound wave being analyzed. Contains two or three pauses of the vocal folds. You can tell how f- how far apart、uh, they are. How far apart they are. How far apart they are. Apart. They are. Apart they are. Apart they are. Apart 要高一点 Apart they are. Uh huh. And hence know the frequency. All right. So he says that you can either know that a pulse has happened, or If the piece of the sound wave being analyzed contains two or three pulses of the vocal folds, you can tell how far apart they are, and thus know the frequency, or hence know the frequency. So if the time dimension is very clear, 有没有发生那次的那个 vibration? 有 time to frequency. The time frequency is clear. Then we can tell. Yes, there was a pulse there. If the time frequency,、uh, time dimension is not clear, it's going to be blurred over. We won't see it. If it's one pulse, two pulses, three pulses, we won't see it clearly because the frequencies they keep on singing, 
and it's going to smudge them together. So in order to see each pulse separately and clearly, we need a clear time dimension, which is why we, used, we use wideband spectrograms most of the time. Jihu dosu zayong wideband. We use narrowband for intonation, for tone, for stress, for things like that. But for vowels, for, for vowels and consonants, for segments, we almost always use wideband because we want the time dimension to be clear. That's usually our priority. All right. Mm. I know the bell has rung, but can we do one more paragraph? Because this was only one side. We talked about keeping the time dimension clear. Now we want to keep, and now if we want to make the frequency dimension really clear, what's going to happen? Okay? Spectrograms that are more accurate in the frequency dimensions. Frequency dimension. Frequency dimension. Contrast. Yeah. At the, the expense of accuracy. Mm -hmm. At the expense of accuracy right. in the time dimension right. are called narrowband spectrograms. Figure 8.16 shows both wide and narrowband spectrograms of the question is pet set or mat? Look at it quickly. 816 on the next page. We've looked at it before, but now it's come up naturally in our reading. So look at the top one. Is the top one wide band or narrow band? This is the one, this is the one that we're accustomed to seeing because so far it's been almost all wide band. The one below it has really clear horizontal stripes, doesn't it? What are those stripes? The smaller stripes, not the thicker formant bands, but the smaller stripes. And those are the overtones. overtones. Right, it's showing us all the overtones. These two are the same spectrogram. They're the same thing. So look at all the information we're missing with the wideband spectrogram. We're getting the information most important to us, namely the new events of every moment. Okay? So we do pay a price for it. We're sacrificing a very clear view of the overtones. And the formants are also much clearer in the narrow band spectrogram. But if we look at the narrow band, we are not getting very clear moment to moment reports on what's happening. Alright? Let's just finish the paragraph and that'll be it for today. In a wide band spectrogram, there in are wide in the wide band mm -hmm. spectrogram. In a wide band spectrogram, mm -hmm. there are sharp spikes at the release of each stop. 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 Mm -hmm. For example, if the d hmm? at the end Who's if? Uh, for the d at the end of the utterance the spikes are smeared in the time dimension in the narrow band spectrogram in the narrow band spectrogram in the narrow band spectrogram mm -hmm. dimension dimension good but the frequencies that compose each format are visible good formant very good all right so this at least we've seen both sides. This is what a wide band spectrogram does. This is what a narrow band spectrogram does. Each one gives us very important information, but our priority is usually time. It's our own personal priority. We want to see changes in time clearly and accurately. characteristic, which is why we almost always prefer a wide band spectrogram. Um, are we okay? Any questions? Lots of new information, lots of physics, but it relates to language. And when you pull the two together, it's very rich. There's really a lot of interesting stuff. OK, that's it. We will see you Monday. Don't forget your notes. Remember to work on vowels and consonants. Also, do this spectrogram. That's an assignment. Do this spectrogram. And this one, I'll show you how to find it. You can compare it to the one that I made because I think it's clearer. Personally, I think it's easier to read. Okay, this is intermediate phonetics. This is phonetics two. Go all the way down to the bottom of the page. 
有没有看到最后这些字比较密的这些东西？有没有看到 Karen Jones' version of the spectrogram on Latifoga, page 201? It's not page 201 anymore. 它那个页码变二零九。But it's way at the bottom. Just come up here. It's the second line in this bunch of links. So look at that one. Look at both of them. Print it out. Compare it to the one in the book. So please, I would like all of you to try and read this sentence. Bring it to class on Monday. Seriously, try. I mean, don't. Don't do it until you tear your hair out. If you get really frustrated, put it down, come back to it later. But really give it an honest effort. Really try hard. See if you can do it. If there are things you don't get, it's okay. Try to get as much as you can. If you get part of it, that's great. Okay? That's it. We'll see you on Monday.